Yes, uh, good uh, morning again to all our doctoral and master students and our facilitators uh, to this. Uh, I'd like to welcome us all to the second lecture in the ACE 811912 courses. Uh, I'm very delighted to welcome our five-star lecturer. I will introduce him in a minute. Uh, but I would like uh, Professor Adishokwe to know that uh, we have the doctoral students, we have the master students, and we have some, you know, very senior citizens in academia, in scholarship. Uh, you can see the vice chancellor of the University of Badon, Professor Duola Inka. You can see the vice chancellor of uh, Taishula University of Education, uh, Professor Arik Babu. Uh, you see the deputy vice chancellor of Osho State University, Professor Anthony Kola Ulusonya, and uh, 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 quite a lot of others. So uh, let me admit those students who are just coming in. And uh, <coughs> distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear students, I would wish to. Uh, introduce, let me see Professor Shabani, whether it's uh, here already. Uh, Professor Shabani, I'm sure, will join us. Uh, uh, let me introduce to you our distinguished uh, lecturer. Uh, I will mute. So, again, I welcome you all, and uh, I want to introduce our lecturer to you. He will interact with us for 45 minutes. He is uh, a Boeing Distinguished Professor of STEM Education. You know, Boeing is the giant aircraft manufacturing industry. So to be a Boeing Distinguished Professor, you know, it's not a main fit. Uh, he is a distinguished is a Boeing Distinguished Professor of STEM Education. Let, let me share my screen so that you will see the citation of the uh, lecturer. He's based at uh, Washington State University, Pullman. Uh, his current research focuses on the use of systematic reviews and meta-analysis for evidence-based practices, cognitive and pedagogical underpinnings of learning with computer-based multimedia resources, an investigation of instructional principles and assessments in STEM education. Dr. Adishokwe's research is mostly funded. Uh, Sukomi, are you there? So you look at uh, funding now, funded by the National Science Foundation and published in top Peer reviewed journals. Dr. Adishokwe has over 100 published journal papers, books, book chapters, and proceedings, and he has presented over 80 conference papers in national and international conferences. He's an associate editor of the Journal of, of Educational Psychology. That's one of the world's leading psychology journals. World leading and a senior associate editor for a journal of engineering education and he sits on the editorial board of several top tier journals including the review of educational research this is a mighty one he is a recipient of several awards including the aera that's the american educational research association's early career researcher my pleasure uh, ladies and gentlemen to ask uh, professor shola Dishokwe to take us through Lecture number two. Over to you, Shola. You can share your screen. Yeah. Right. Um, um, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning from, um, from the West Coast of the United States. Uh, uh, first, I want to say uh, a big thank you to a uh, distinguished professor and uh, my mentor, uh, Professor uh, Peter Okebukola. Um, I I have known I, Professor Kebukola for almost three decades, almost three decades. and, uh, and um, he, um, 
he was principally one of the reasons uh, actually the big reason why i'm here today because i used to just look up to him uh, the way he did things and he still does things uh, brought a lot of inspiration to me uh, personally and to many uh, of of my generation so uh, to professor kebukola anything that i do uh, on this platform i want to sort of just acknowledge you and let you know you had a reason uh, with got app uh, that that i'm here today so thank you so very much sir, for everything that you've done for me and uh, for those who are privileged to be taking this course from professor a uh, distinguished professor Kevukola, i just want to let you know you couldn't have been any big luck here uh, to have him uh, mentoring you and 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 teaching you um uh this course uh, he has also assembled a, a great array of intellectuals uh, so i'm just um the list of them so you will get to see many of them as the course progresses can, can you all hear me please okay sir yes sir. so today we want to talk about research as a process um i also want to apologize if you uh, see me uh, see uh, uh, a cup of hot tea is 3 a.m three o'clock here uh in uh pacific um uh, uh northwest pacific side of the united states so um that's where i'm trying to keep warm <laughs> so it's not meant to be disrespectful please I'm, I'm so sorry if you feel that way um so uh we'll just go to uh where i am from so that you can see a little bit of uh, my world uh, uh this is uh, just one side of uh, just one little part of Washington State University Pullman campus. Um, we have uh, five uh, campuses, but this is the main campus here in Pullman. Uh, it's like being at um, OAU, so Pullman is five hours drive away from Seattle, one hour flight uh, to Seattle as well. And you know, last National Association for Research in Science Teaching was take place in portland oregon uh, this year we are also about six hours drive to portland and about an hour 15 minutes flight to portland um, this is another view of uh, our campus uh, that's a main football field um, american football by the way uh, this picture was taken um, around fall of 20 um 19 uh, so you can see just a little bit of uh, uh campus uh there uh another view of campus um college of education is just beside um uh this this um, front building here that you see uh, just to give you a little bit of where i'm a uh, uh, resident and where i'm privileged to to teach um, I'll also tell you a little bit about my interest. Uh, you can see a number of things. I'm, uh, um, you know, I'm interested in quite a number of things. I'm the type who uh, came from different areas of work. Um, I did my uh, undergrad in computer science back in Nigeria. And, uh, you know, even when we were doing introductions on Saturday, uh, when distinguished uh, Professor Kebukola brought all the facilitators together on Saturday, it was really humbling to me because in that uh, uh, meeting, I saw people who taught my instructors. So, <laughs> so this, these were not even people who taught me. These were people who taught, like Professor Kebukola, these were people who taught, the people who taught me. So really, really humble to be part of this. So my first uh, degree was in computer science. So you can see traces of computer science there. I moved to the United States to work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to work on the U.S. Department of Education project, uh, a computer programming project to bring African languages to uh, American citizens. That was a precarious time in the history of our country. We had military rulers then. Americans uh, ordinarily would have sent, American government would have sent uh, Americans to Nigeria to learn 
uh, uh, African languages, particularly Yoruba, Igbo, and Arusa languages. But because of the political uh, situation in Nigeria then, so what they did was to bring African scholars to the U.S. Uh, to develop uh, resources for learning African language. So I was the first person that was brought to the U.S. under that scheme. It was a $1.4 million project back in 1998-99. Uh, so brought here to come and develop uh, uh, CD runs, DVDs, and things like that for and, and online courses for teaching of uh, African languages. So many, many hundreds and uh, maybe probably now thousands of uh, masters and PhD students in uh, American students learn through that effort and are now professors of African languages uh, at different in different universities in the year. So you can see traces of that multimedia learning adaptive systems. Then I did my master's in educational technology uh, at Simon Fraser University, moved to Canada then. Uh, Ed Psych uh, did a lot of research methodology, meta analysis, uh, and then uh, master's PhD. I, I became very much interested in concept mapping, which is one of the. I, think, uh, I would say here that uh, Professor Kebukola is the leading researcher in concept mapping in the whole of Africa. I mean, so I got exposed to his work and Professor Lujegede uh, as a graduate student, reading so many of the active learning strategies uh, work. They were the pioneers of that work in the whole of Africa. Uh, then, so I picked up on that literature, began, began to do a lot of meta-analysis, and then I was fortunate to uh, during my PhD, moved to my advisor, moved from ed tech to ed psych. And you will wonder how could someone leave technology for psychology? That's the dynamics of North American education. I mean, I, I was fascinated to work with Phil Winnie, who was a bad Bandura student at Stanford. Phil finished his PhD, I think, about 1972, uh, 72 to 73, thereabout. Uh, early 70s at Stanford University. He worked, he was a student of Albert Bandura. Uh, so I got to see self regulated learning and social cognitive theoretical uh, framework. I uh, learned that under Phil Winnie, uh, who was uh, one of my um, um, you know, advisors in school. Then I finished my PhD, moved back to the US. And uh, the big thing in U.S. Uh, then and still now was STEM education. So I began to do, based on my background, began to do a lot of STEM education work, particularly research, design, assessment, evaluation, and then got into the world of learning analytics too, based on my competing background. And, and learning analytics is really, really one of the emerging trends. Uh, STEM education, learning analytics, uh, emerging trends in education, research today as well as meta analysis too why because uh, with the advent of competing and, and many many super computing uh, technologies we have billions of data points at any point in time in most days uh, when people when students study online you know banking operations and any type of operations so what we then have is a, is a sea of data that we don't know what to deal with, how to deal with it. So one of the things that I do is learning analytics, looking into how do we make sense of large data. Uh, again, you will see traces of emerging trends in educational research. As I talk, I'm not particularly going to focus on this, but you can pick uh, some of those things up. So I have a number of uh, uh, granting operations I have uh, over the past 10 years uh, only. I have one 10 national science foundation grants four of those are ongoing um in fact four of those grants were awarded over the last um uh, i would say 12 months or so 12 to 15 months uh, or so meta analysis of the effect of reputational materials for promoting conceptual change in stem 
uh, conceptual change is huge. People have misconceptions, and mis those misconceptions are actually very formidable. Um, depending on the source and the nature of those misconceptions. So uh, so we wanted to do a meta-analysis of one uh, instructional strategy, uh, reputational uh, you know, pedagogy to help uh, advance or foster or promote conceptual change in STEM education. Uh, the second one is actually uh, that's uh, a huge, huge grant, uh, close to three million US dollars. It's called the Educate Project, and it's a it's an acronym for Educating Diverse Undergraduate Communities, Affordable Transport Equipment. This is teaching key uh, engineering uh, principles using hands-on, low-cost desktop learning modules. Uh, it's a nationwide project. We are broadly disseminating the use of these fabricated low-cost desktop learning modules uh, in I I think uh, we're close to 55 different universities uh, now that we're working with in the United States. And NSF is actually giving us more money uh, to be able to work on this now. Um, with um, Chris Onansi and I, Chris is a faculty here, we are exploring the use of brown feed programming assignments in undergraduate computing education. This idea of brown feed, and, and again, I want to spend time uh, just a little bit of time on some of these grants so you can see some imagined big ideas in the field of education, more broadly in STEM. Uh, this idea of brown feed programming is very, very important. If you are hired in, uh, uh, in Microsoft or in Amazon or in Google or in Facebook today, what you are going to be working, you are not going to be developing new software tools. The truth is that you, we have the benchmarks or the foundations for many, many of the uh, 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 things in our world today. If you are an engineer, uh, the chances of building new bridges in America is very remote. Those bridges have been built. So how do you understand the, 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 the concrete, the nature, the, the pour, all, all the components uh, mixed with weather forces and environmental uh, issues and nature to the point that uh, someone had written a program uh, for Windows XP or Windows whatever. Uh, if you had a Microsoft, what you're going to be doing is looking at a programming, a code, uh, 10,000, 20,000 line code that someone else had written five years ago and making sense of that code in such a way that you can uh, enhance or develop a new, a new operating system. That is not the way uh, we teach computing science. Uh, in many of our nation's uh, schools, uh, and I would think in Nigeria, what we mostly do is give people uh, tough programming assignments, ask them to go and write a new program. But what we are finding out is that the ability to understand a program, a code written by someone else, and the ability to ask deep questions is equally as important, in fact, even if not more important than developing a new uh, uh, program. So this whole project is set up to do that. NSF funded the idea, even at the very first uh, uh, trial. Uh, dean Plan, uh, uh, Candice Claiborne was the former dean of the College of Engineering uh, here at Washington State University, and I, I just got a phone call from a few uh, like about two years ago saying that, hey, uh, uh, Shola, I need to work with you um, in engineering education uh, and science education, looking at engineering students and computer science students' persistent success and participation in multiple high impact engagement activities at many land grant institutions in the United States. I mean, again, just those four, but I can go on a number. I don't want to spend uh, too much time on that. Um, I also have a number of uh, internally funded projects. Again, uh, some of the editorial board and editorial uh, positions, as uh, our distinguished professor Kebukola told you. Uh, 
All right, um, let's move um, now to the learning outcomes. I want to uh, believe that the end of this lecture, and um, maybe not just only the end of this lecture, by the time you interact with materials for this week, uh, you will be able to identify research question and hypothesis in a given study, evaluate whether those questions are researchable or not. Uh, you will be able to become more informed consumer of research uh, more informed, uh, really, really, uh, consumer of research. Uh, tell whether a research study is ethical or legal, uh, what type of data is needed uh, uh, to, to answer a question. And well, we will still we have a whole week to talk about uh, systematic reviews and, and meta analysis. So, uh, talking about research problem, am I going too fast? I'm, I want to be respectful of your time. So, that's why I'm yeah, I, I think it's fair enough. Good, good pace. Okay, good sir. Pace. All right, sir. Thanks, sir. So, uh, why is a, a research being conducted? I mean, people uh, think that in academia we only we have all the time. We do what we want, and uh, uh, you know, it's okay to a certain extent, but it's not also okay. Um, the way we approach research is to think about a problem of national or international importance. Uh, the the uh, first project that I told you of a meta-analysis of uh, refutational text, uh, when we put that project together, that was when we started thinking about that idea, that was when the president of the U.S., um, uh, President Trump, would always talk about fake news fake news. It, it became, and, and even in this day of coronavirus, you read lots, tons and tons of information and you wonder, wow, how are people this uh, uh, illiterate, so to say, in the type of information they forward around in social media and so on and so forth. So it's meant to really, research is meant to address a particular problem of national or even international importance. If you can situate your research to address a particular problem really good then the, the other question is what sparked interest what gap or void in knowledge are we seeking to fill uh, research is something that wakes us up at night research is something that uh, my kids even my 10 year old boy can tell you some of what I do, because it's something that we are passionate about. Over dinner table, we talk about it, uh, you know, so it's something, it must be something that sustains your interest, because there will be difficult days ahead when uh, your your data will not support your hypothesis, and you are thinking about how do I, what do I do with it? So, uh, it must be something that sparks your interest. Then, once you know that, oh, this is a problem, uh, the, the next question is that the next thing to think about is how do I create questions or hypotheses to investigate that problem? Uh, so the research question is the question that you are trying to answer when you do your research on a particular topic. Meanwhile, research hypothesis is a state statement that, yeah, you can say, yeah, let me see how uh, true or not uh, this is. So you suddenly become a scientist. You put forth an idea or hypothesis. And those hypotheses are not just put uh, up or put together uh, without any theoretical grounding. A good hypothesis is seated on a solid theoretical grounding, on a big body of empirical literature, uh, so, and it's usually stated in a directional uh, form. You know, you can have it now, too. Um, they serve the same purposes in many articles, although some researchers, um, including Nathan Soda, uh, the textbook author that I use, uh, would differentiate them. Uh, that, you know, and we will have examples. An example of a research question is, does sleep have an effect on reflexes? That is a research question. A research hypothesis could be maximum reflex efficiency is achieved after eight hours of sleep. That is an hypothesis there being put forward. So, so now you know uh, a research problem, a, a big problem, uh, you're trying to fill it, a void or a gap, 
when you develop a research question, you can also develop an hypothesis that is based on theory and a body of empirical literature. Um, there are different criteria for good research questions. Um, a, a good research question should be feasible. You need to have adequate number of participants or subjects, adequate technical expertise. It should be feasible in terms of affordability in time and money. You are, um, many of you are graduate students. You certainly do not want to propose a longitudinal study that will take 20 years. Uh, to, to accomplish. <laughs> that is not feasible. So you need to look at your research question and think about the feasibility of that question within the boundaries or constraints of the time and the money that you have. A good research question is interesting. Should be interesting to you. Should be interesting to as to you as an investigator. But uh, particularly in, in, in our context here in the US, and I would say even for the most part in Nigeria, because the project that you are all stated uh, under, it's a funded project by the World Bank. So when uh, a distinguished professor Kebu Kola was setting this uh, proposal up, he, he thought of what would be an interesting idea to a World Bank. So you also have to think about your funding agency. What is it that will be interesting to your funding agency? Uh, a good research question should be novel. Novelty in terms of conducting original uh, study, study that advances uh, empirical literatures, but not or just also more recently in, uh, in the field of education, particularly in the Journal of Educational Psychology, we are moving, we are developing a broader agenda to also accept replication studies. Why is replication study important? Replication studies are important because we need to be able to examine robustness of findings. Uh, is a particular finding in America robust or replicable when different participants are drawn from uh, different environments or, or, you know, different places or under different settings? So uh, it, it really should be novel in terms of conducting original study and extending the work of others. It should be ethical. A good research question should be ethical to both human and animal subjects. It should be relevant to scientific knowledge, to clinical and health policy, and uh, uh, to have future research direction. In fact, when I teach research methods class, I always tell my students that when you propose a good research question, one good research question, you should seek to answer that question, but a good research question will leave you with three unanswered questions. Okay, at the end of the story, at least. So that's why we never go out of job in academia, because we always create more problems when we try to solve a, a, a one problem, solving one problem, but you create three or more problems. So that we, we keep having jobs, so we keep having ideas as we go forward. Um, so researchable, uh, uh, can you collect data to answer your question? Think about your question and think about, would I be, well, how would I collect data to answer this question? When you create your research question, be careful of should questions, should this or the best question. And I would explain what I mean by that. So propose a research question or hypothesis and explain why it is researchable. Or, or not, and I, I will give you, we don't have a lot of time, so I, I would have invited comments from you, but look at these questions, are they researchable? Should the school year be lending to include most of the summer months? Can someone tell me if that question is researchable? Yeah, you can unmute your microphone, class, anybody, and then uh, answer from Sadisha people you don't we don't propose things and say this should be it there's nothing like that there's always uh the, it's it's all our work is always probabilistic so to say there's always that chance of error that's why we you will learn about standard error of measurement and things like that so that that was should there only disqualifies that question uh, and i you know i can go on and uh on, on does research prove students learn to read best by phonics instruction prove 
it's it's another problematic another word problematic uh, when you are thinking uh, of uh, creating uh, researchable uh, questions. So uh, some other examples, uh, these are what I would call non-researchable questions. Should moral education be taught in school along with reading? What is the best way of teaching problem-solving skills? Uh, and so on and so forth. So but look at should, the best. But then let's go to researchable question. You can change that should to the children who receive formal instruction in character education have higher levels of moral reasoning. That is, you can explore that, you can manipulate that, so to say. What method or lecture, and I do have to tell you, I come more from a, a quantitative background, so if you disagree with me, it's, it's totally okay. <laughs> we can meet somewhere in the middle, okay? So, what uh, the method, what method, lecture or discussion is most effective, is, or I should say, is effective for increasing students problem solving skills particularly in a in a in a, in a context uh, when you say that you have put some boundaries so which is good uh, when you do uh, when you create your research questions uh, the next thing is legal and ethical they should research studies should be voluntary no coercion at all uh, they should be well a, particularly in our world here, we need to have informed consent. And people have to agree to participate in the study. No deception, no harm, except deception is a key part of the study. There are many psychological studies that they were looking at deception, except that, and those go through very, very uh, scrutinized protocol uh, from institutional re review board. No invasion of privacy. Uh, there should be confidentiality and integrity. Uh, we need to debrief our participants. The benefits need to uh, outweigh the risk. And the role of institutional review board uh, in, in, in many, many parts of the world, institutional review boards are set up to regulate the process of conducting research so that participants are not put at risk. So you submit your protocol to the IRB office, they go through it, they ask you questions, how would you ensure participants' confidentiality? How would you ensure this or that? So it's, it's always a good uh, check, and there's an international body that also regulates uh, uh, those kinds of practices. Um, the next thing is answered already. Uh, I talked about reputation and extension, uh, repeating and earlier research. Sometimes you can add some other features. Those would help increase generalizability and produce additional informa information. Um, we have different online journals to um, answer already. Sometimes we think about meta-analysis or systematic reviews because uh, uh, it's it's more about looking at something that had been answered. Okay, you have a, you have a, uh, you know, 1,000 studies that have been published in concept mapping. Then we go in there to synthesize uh, all the findings so that we can provide a landscape of uh, major findings or key findings in that area. And we do that very, very statistically. Uh, there's a process that we need to go through and we will talk about, about that as we go on in this course. Um, there's also what, what uh, is called operationalization in, in research. Uh, we have many of the uh, educational research or even STEM uh, education research, they deal with constructs. Uh, what really is learning? Um, what is love, you know, or interest, so to say, or motivation? How do we, these are not tangible things that we can touch. So the question then becomes, how do we operationalize uh, these constructs in our study? So you need to think also about operational definition. You need to think about measurement. How do I measure interest? How do I measure motivation? And so on and so forth. Um, there's also the concept of uh, the types of variables, independent and dependent variables. Uh, uh, independent variables are related to or influences the dependent variables. Sometimes we say they predict the dependent variables, or they are called the predictor variables or explanatory variable. Um, it's an intervention presumed cause of some effect, and they are usually manipulated by the researcher. Uh, 
you see, you can have true independent variables and quasi uh, uh, independent, true independent variables. Uh, you have random assignment of participants to uh, uh, to groups, and it helps most, I, I would say, stronger conclusions about the cost. You can really, really say that, oh, if you do ran randomization, uh, it, it's we, in science, they call it the gold standard, although, I mean, you know, uh, people can disagree with that. But randomization has been known for many decades, really, really have come true for many threats to validity of causal inferences. Uh, there's also the causal experimental variable um, that, that does not allow random assignment of participants when there's no random assignment. When there are uh, uh, pure naturalistic cases where you cannot randomize participants to groups. Um, you know, things are going on in, in New York now. Uh, if you want to see the effect of uh, maybe one thing on, uh, on, on treating uh, uh, people who are fearful about coronavirus, uh, if you if you go to New York, uh, compare New York with Vermont or, or Boise, Idaho, those are two different locations. So there's no way to randomly assign uh, people to New York. Those who live in New York live in New York. They are dealing with the fear of coronavirus more than someone who is in Boise. So that's a classic case of where you cannot really randomize participants to any group. You just have to use a causa experimental design that looks into, yep, this is central New York, Manhattan area. I want to compare people uh, feel here in that community with those who live in Boise, Idaho. There's also dependent variables, uh, which is a measured outcome. Uh, uh, and, and I do want to say that this is my preference for research. I love to have more dependent variables than independent variables. I'm very much interested in that many researchers are. Uh, so when you manipulate, let's say, two independent variables, you do want to have two, three, four, five dependent variables so that you can examine the robustness of findings across those dependent variables. We don't have time, so but I will briefly go through this. Uh, let me give you an example. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. What is the independent variable? Anyone, please? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's a common popular saying. Uh, but for me, a typical Nigerian, you can see that, yes, uh, for me, it's not just only only an apple. Uh, when I eat an Ebai day or an Amalai day or Inyai day, I'm an Ijesha man. <laughs> me away from, <laughs> from the doctor. So what, what would be the independent variable there? Anyone, please. Yes. Anyone, Would please. it for you in the class? You can unmute yourselves. Good morning, sir. 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 I think the dependent variable there is the doctor. Because when you treat an apple, you don't have any reason to visit the doctor. Okay, I didn't. I didn't hear you well. But if I had uh, what you said, I think you said the independent variable is the doctor. No, no, no. He's saying that the dependent variable. Yes. Is the doctor being kept away? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and your independent variable is the hapu. Okay, so you can you can look at someone who had had an apple a day. You can study someone who had had an apple a day for for one year. Compare the as with the earth factors on earth indicators. Those are the constructs that I was talking about. You can compare that their fitness, their days, their diet, their blood pressure. You can compare that with another group of participants who had not had apple an apple a day. So we have five more minutes. Five more minutes. Five more minutes, sir. Okay. So that apple then becomes your independent variable, and then the the the, the associated earth indicators will become your dependent variables. So we also have the attribute variables. They are mostly called uh, the moderator variables. Um, there's a lot of work on S-parties reversal effect by Slava Kayuga. 
uh, in education, classic educational psychology literature, we call them the attitude treatment interactions. Uh, there are extraneous variables which, if not controlled, they can confound or mix up your findings. And they are, we call them threats to the validity of your findings. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, blaze through now. We have a number of examples here. Um, a confounding occurs when a research uh, allows two or more variables to change together. Be very careful of that. When you are measuring something, measure just that one thing and control for other things. Because the moment you let two variables change together, they can potentially confound uh, uh, your your findings. Hey, take someone who laughs every one hour or so, uh, compare their health indicators with someone who is always funny. Then there's one thing that I would like to leave you with you before I leave theory-based research process. It's very important that our research needs to speak to theory uh, advanced. There's what I, we call practical, theoretical, and uh, empirical implications of our research. So when you conduct research, think about how those findings can be used in practice. Think about how those findings can develop or advance methods, and think about how those uh, our findings can be used to build up uh, theories. So it's it's very very important to 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 do that. All right, uh, and I, I will end with correlation does not imply causation. I, I, even though this is the first day, but I want to really echo this idea that you become so humble when you do research. Uh, someone, a master's student, uh, almost failed uh, his, his thesis um, uh, like 15 years ago because the guy conducted one study and started making uh, all sorts of claims uh, with a correlational study. No, correlation does not imply causation, but the absence of correlation implies the absence of uh, causation. If X correlates with Y, then possibly X causes Y, my cause Y, Y my cause X, or both X and Y might be caused by a third uh, variable. And I, I can, you know, uh, uh, later when we have question or later in the course, I can, you know, talk to you more about that. Um, I, I hand here, because I know I don't have time again, uh, think about uh, during this week, pick one of these research questions, design a research study to address it. You don't have to be extensive, even if it's just one paragraph. This will be my research question, my dependent variable, independent variable, and so on. Think about all of these factors as you design your study. And then another one work is to list five emerging trends in educational research and in 200 words or less discuss five key points about one of the emerging trends uh, that you listed. Thank you so much. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so, so very much, uh, Professor Adeshofe. We very deeply appreciate the uh, extensive treatment, extensive treatment of this topic number two for this uh, AC 811812. Uh, well, the class is now open. Uh, for the next uh, 12 minutes for comments and questions as you were earlier informed you are going to get the powerpoint file for this presentation and for the one that i had earlier and in another two hours or so you're going to get a video recording of this presentation i can see that uh kulola de said is up already please you have the floor you have the floor Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Professor Adeshope Omishola, for that wonderful delivery. My sir, I want to comment on an analogy. If you go, this is our own context. If you go to, say, a local environment, and you begin to talk about how computer is working, the internet, for those who are farmers, 
They won't enjoy you as much as you talking about tractor. We're not gonna logic say that. Looking at all the trends that I was able to pick from what you said, they are they are fine. But are they applicable to our current in Nigeria now in advancing what our professional problems are? If they are, I would like to touch on on that. If they are not, then I will want to suggest to this class five best trending. Um, to, um, I mean, I mean, trending, trending styles that we can explore, that we can explore as, we on as we progress on our studies. To our, own to our own context. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Uh, 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 I'm yielding now to. Thank you so very much, uh, 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 distinguished Professor Kebukola. I mean, Kunle, uh, excellent question. This is why I'm proud to be in Nigeria. Uh, if I had this in, in the U.S., people would be looking at me. They want to go home, but uh, we, we we are diligent in Nigeria. So <laughs> thank you for that. Excellent question. In fact, I do think there are some of the emerging trends. So let me back up a little bit. Kule, it's your job to think about research more broadly and apply to local contextual situation. That's why you are in this course. Um, I'm looking for money. Looking if for if money. Nigerian government will Nigerian give me one million dollars, I will think about things that are appropriate for the Nigerian context. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> but the, it's the National Science Foundation that has given you the money. Yeah. You are looking for what is applicable to e brilliant. E yeah. Exactly, sir. Exactly. But 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 so so that that's it. But you are in this course to be able to to become intellectuals who can use the tools and the process of research to really foster development in nigeria this is human empowerment uh this course is really when i went through the, the the list of facilitators and what you are trying to do in this course i know there is hope for nigeria there is hope for africa with, with what you are learning so that's really part of your job class however i do want to uh, uh go back a little bit and say that some of these ideas are really applicable to the nigerian context i have uh, a friend of mine, a one of our PhD students here, he just finished a Cornelius, and you know what he did? He's a Nigerian. Uh, he he now developed an app for farmers in Oshun State's Ilefe area to be able to talk to themselves and talk to uh, uh, manufacturers when there's a pressing need. Let's say that oh, there hasn't been rain. For, for five days, there needs to be some irrigation work or something. Uh, as you talk, talked about the example of tractors and things like that. So Cornelius developed this app and through that app, farmers can have interaction. So that is one area where tools of research and uh, development in STEM can actually help address local context. So there are so many possibilities, but again, it, that's our job in this class to find uh, practical problems in our society that can be addressed uh, by research. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So, who else is asking a question? Uh, it can be a student, it can be a vice chancellor or facilitator. Yes, Sukomi, Mr. Sukomi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. A big thank you to Professor Shola Adeshope for this wonderful lecture. My question is based on a particular slide that we talked about, operationalization. So I'm presently I'm working on my thesis for masters, which has to do with e-learning, and I'm tagging it with spillover of COVID-19. But there are some things that I found very, very difficult to use. And when you talk about this operationalization, for example, some of the hidden things that China are behind it. I'm trying to compare the Nigerian government trying to use a TV as a and he led it to for our secondary school students. And I find it difficult. Look at what we are doing now. Eh? Some of those hidden things that China is keeping, or some of those hidden things that Nigeria government is 
keep it eh, from the masses so that we can really enjoy this e-learning platform for us as an example. Please, can you throw more light on the term operationalization in this context? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Sokham Ingwele. Um, it, uh, you, you brought up a very good point. I could, uh, I'm, I'm also, I would call myself an activist and a, uh, and a, and a, and a radical scholar when it comes to uh, things like this about uh, policy, politics, and, and research. Uh, uh, and I may not speak directly to your question, but at the end of the, the, my answer, I hope you are fired up in such a way to use the tools and process of research to advance our country. This is my this is my philosophy. I believe that research should drive practice and policy. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And it's not just only in Nigeria, it's almost everywhere. I, I did my sabbatical at the University of London uh, a few years ago. And why? I went to that university because there's a group of systematic review and meta-analytic scholars who are looked up to by the UK government when there's any problem or when there's any policy that the UK government wants to adopt say in two or three years from now, they come to that center and say, hey, please, can you help us uh, look at the pros and cons of advancing this policy? Look at countries that have done this. And so they do a, more of a systematic review and meta analysis, and they hand that report to the government, and it helps the government, the lawmakers, in it guides them in that decision-making process. I mean, even the UK does it to a, a, to a very small level, and and and, and I, when I worked in Canada, I worked with Canadian Council on Learning. That was the goal. We don't have such a system in the US. Uh, in fact, even in the UK and Canada, there's a politics many times overrides research. So here is the problem, and I'm also even in Nigeria. I do believe that. The research process should dictate to a very reasonable extent the kind of policies and practices that government uh, put, will put in place. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case. But this is why you are in this class. Again, uh, think about how you want to operationalize literacy in this COVID-19 time. Uh, think about how you want to operationalize anything that you are doing. Well, your operationalization, again, has to be grounded in research, in theory. Again, because you are a scholar, you don't just want to publish, uh, let your advisor see your work. I, I, I tell my masters and PhD students, I will not sit on any committee if that study is not publishable. You want people around the world to see this is what we are doing. So think very broadly about grounding your operationalization and the process of research in an extant body of literature so that you can move your ideas past your committee members or past the four walls of the university to, to many other scholars around the world. I know I did not directly answer China. I go to China and I consult for them. So I want to be careful if they are hearing me. But again, I think that research should dictate what happens in practice and policies. Uh, wonderful. Thank you all so very much. Unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions now. Time is up. Uh, you may wish to uh, send your uh, questions to email your questions to Professor Adesokwe. But I can see E. I. I shake him. I Aisha Kie, she's anxious. So make it very brief and let uh, Professor Adisha Kwe answer uh, also very briefly. So you have the floor. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for Professor Adisha Kwe for his presentation. Um, well, it's not a question but a uh, request. I would like him to allow us to uh, do his assignment, uh, no, our assignment, it's ours now, uh, to do our assignment based on our research, uh, because uh, we are running, um, uh, we have to deal with the time that we have, we are limited in uh, time, so uh, it would be better to use our own research so that we can uh, make progress. 
progress. It will be better than it be better um, than it's our humble request. It's humble if it's request, possible, then we can proceed with the, the, our Z questions, questions, and that is where we get our uh, constructive uh, feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Professor Adishakwe, you have the floor. Oh, okay, sir. Well, that's the whole essence of research. Again, remember what I said, it has to be interesting to you. It doesn't have to be interesting to me, it's your research. It has to be something that keeps you up at night and you are dancing about it because it's so exciting to you. So you have the floor. Go ahead with it. Uh, make your research question something that you are passionate about and we would celebrate that with you. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Wonderful. So on that note, I'm going to ask, uh, your E is what, uh, Dr. Aisha? Emanuela. E Emanuela. Oh, Emanuela, yes. I'd like you to move yes. a vote of thanks uh, uh, on, on our behalf uh, to uh, Professor Adesio uh, to just thank him because our time is up. Yeah. Please, move a vote of thanks on our behalf. Yes, we're waiting. Emanuela, vote of thanks. Okay thank, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, Professor Olusola for, for your presentation. Uh, we hope that, uh, we we'll, hope keep that we'll keep working together. Working we together. keep in touch and in touch hope and that this, hope um, this uh, opportunity that we got, thanks to uh, Professor Okebukola, and uh, this is his second time. We are glad that uh, he keeps finding things that can uh, help. Uh, young, uh, young African, African researchers, researchers to make the um, progress. Um, progress. And thank you and all, thank you um, all, all the participants, all the, participants, all the professors the who have been there. Have been there. Thank, you. Um, thank you. Let's meet next time. Let's meet next time. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Emanuela. Uh, I like the way you pronounce Professor Adisha's question. It's as if you are a Nigerian. I mean, you pronounce it, you know, accent-free. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, the next time, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be tomorrow morning at 10. We have just two hours every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and that's it. So I'll see you next week, uh, excuse me, tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, on behalf of all of us, again, I, I join... Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuela, yes. Aisha yes. Kiye in thanking everybody. So, bye bye now. Bye. I'm sure Professor Adisha Kwe is about uh, what time you, you have like about uh, 4 a.m. now. That's right. Uh, so, I'm right. sure you're going to uh, have some sleep. Bye bye. bye. And uh, God bless us all. Bye.